Right. There we go. So, welcome to CH302. We've got everything up here for um, this semester. Um, we have, a, it's the very first day of class, and so we have lots to do today. Um, we're going to think about some of the things from last semester, things we need to remember for success in 302, figure out some things about the uh, folks we have here who are going to be helping us as a teaching team. Um, randomly, we also have the CMS videographers here who are taking some pictures of people. They're just trying to get some, some action shots of learning in action. And so everyone do your best to be learning today so that it looks good on the video. Um, quickly, um, I want to think about meeting our teaching team who is here today. So if you are a graduate TA and you are here, and if you are an undergraduate peer learning assistant, you, you'll stand up a second so people can see you, lay eyes to you. Lots and lots of help in the class. So we will very quickly run around so that we can have everybody introduce themselves in two seconds. You can just tell people your name and whether you're a graduate or an undergraduate uh, learning system. Lee. We also have Sophie who is here. She's going to be helping me up front as well as helping out uh, going on. And we're missing one of our graduate TAs. He's, oh, there she is. Great. She's just in the nick of time. <coughs> Super. All right. Um, oh, yeah. If somehow you are, are strongly, strongly, strongly opposed to um, showing up in our video. Make sure you come and, and let us know. But beware, um, the front of the room all the time is on the video cameras in the back. And that's so that if you're not here in class, that would never happen. But if you're not here in class, you would be able to watch after to check out what the video is. Thus, the warning is on the door outside saying, beware, you will be videoed. I um, want to think about the syllabus very quickly. I'm not going to spend lots of time um, going over it because you can go and check it out yourself. Um, it's on our Canvas site, so uh, you want to be sure you get to Canvas um, and then look for the class. Um, there are three classes on Tuesday, Thursday that will be together in mine and two of Dr. Sparks' sections. Um, for simplicity's sake, we are sharing our assignments um, since we're doing all the same things and so we have one site. So you'll be alternatively getting announcements for, for me or Dr. Sparks. Um, most important things on the front here um, will be quizzes and assignments you need to do, but today you want to make sure you'll be able to find the syllabus and look at the syllabus for the class. So one thing of note, um, we have one class email that does say Sparks class, but that's where you want to send it as well because we have ATA who's assigned who will get you an answer to your question or forward your email to the person who needs to answer it. Um, and so you want to be using that email. Um, it has our content for what we're doing this semester. Um, and then things are much the same as be before. So if you took 301 elsewhere, you want to be sure to review um, the syllabus to a greater extent. Uh, otherwise, it will be much like it was last semester. Um, we'll be making use of three uh, additional online out-of-class learning sites. One is Top Hat. Um, that we're going to use for getting answers uh, to questions in class. You can also access it after class to see what happened. Um, we have our ebook, um, ch302.cm.utexas.edu, um, and Sapling. Um, in addition, we will also be using Piazza for class discussions. Um, we have TAs who are assigned to be looking for questions all the time. And I encourage you all to look for questions all the time so that if you have a question about homework or a concept or something on syllabus you're trying to get figured out, Piazza is probably the fastest way um, to be able to get a response. Um, starting right off the bat, too, um, we have some assignments. And I should say, we have some assignments. It's super exciting. Um, and what assignments do we have? It looks like we have a million. 
We have quiz zero and quiz one and quiz two and quiz three. Um, these are all on Canvas, um, and yet I can tell you um, it's really two and three that might take you a little bit of time because those are on some material, but they're, they're short. Quiz one is one question. Um, and quiz zero is to make sure that you actually look at the syllabus. Um, in addition, we have um, a sapling homework that's coming up. We have two sapling homeworks, both zero and homework one, and those are for um, next Tuesday, but we have them open now. Um, one of them, um, and or both of them, are these two, zero and one, are, are both review. Um, one is kind of a get to know sapling thing, and one is a, oh my goodness, what did I forget from 301 thing. And then uh, next time we'll have uh, a homework that is the first one for what is in 302. Um, so we're starting off with rapid pace, um, and a lot of it's just review from last semester um, as a reminder to make sure that you stay on task. So quickly to see if you guys had actually signed up for Top Hat, I have a question for you so you can log on to your Top Hat. If somehow you've never heard of Top Hat in your life, it will be okay because after class you will go and figure it out. Um, if you've forgotten to your login password or whatever, you will again, it will be okay. Today it will be credit all around, but I'm hoping to see just where people are in terms of um, remembering for last semester. Um, our question is very simple, which is um, what class did you have for 301? Should be up and going. Excellent. Look at you guys, all online, answering questions, hundreds of people responding. Okay, I'm just going to look at the answers here. Don't change your answer based on what other people say. Okay, you should stick with your original answer. <coughs> Oops, I don't know what the right answer is. Reports, there we go. Oh, look at that. How nice that you all came back. It just makes me feel warm and fuzzy. Um, and then let's see, we had some folks in Dr. Sparks' class, things would be much the same. Yeah, Dr. McCord, um, you probably did some top hat things in class, but probably had less working uh, in, in terms of uh, some activities. We had one person who tested out a uh, 301, and then four folks who just, it's going to be a whole brand new experience. Um, and so uh, for folks, um, if you're a little lost after today, because the vast majority of people are plowing along in the way that we did 301, um, make sure that you, you take the chance to, um, to review the syllabus. And in particular, if you have other questions, uh, you can come talk to me after class or in office hours, which reminds me um, very quickly to think about office hours. Um, if we look uh, back at our Canvas site, um, there is a nice page at the very beginning that says where office hours and review sessions are. There are many, many, many places to get help throughout the week. In theory, might actually load. Um, it will load eventually. Um, but I just want to say my office hours are normally Wednesday from 3 to 4, but this week, this week only, um, they're at a different time. My office hours are going to be Wednesday, 4 to 5. And they're in W.C. Hogg, not Welch, W.C. Hogg across the street, 2.22222222. Um, and this is when uh, things are normally. So uh, you can see any given day, Monday, want to know where to get help. Tuesday, want to know where to get help. Um, lots of chances. Um, nobody wants to study on Friday, so there's not a lot of office hours on Friday. Um, so, uh, and these will be updated and we'll keep, we keep track so that uh, you guys have a lot of chances. The other thing, keep in mind there are reviews uh, during the week that will, that will go over uh, what we've covered in class. Um, and additionally, uh, these same review times will be used before exams. So with that, I um, want to think about um, what's gonna happen in class. 
Um, and in that vein, we have a little video to think about. It's this one here. And we'll see if we have any sound. I thought it was going to be an easy introductory chemistry course. I kind of ignored the rumors of that it was really a challenging course, and um, I thought it would be a lot like high school chemistry, which was which came really easy to me. I always knew that being a battle breaks class was, you know, unique. Like I said at the beginning, you have plenty of opportunities to learn. They don't just teach one specific way. It's not just a lecture. Uh, Thirty minutes, go home and learn it. This class is definitely a lot of out of the classroom learning. It's kind of lectures, you do demos, you do worksheets, um, you have the textbook, you have homeworks, um, you have videos. I, I would say probably 80% of what I know now has been taught to myself outside of the classroom, but it's because they've given me those sources. And if I didn't catch something or you know, I missed something in class, I was able to go back to the videos and really learn from those. And the homework just sort of helps solidify the information. It is a tough course, so you're not going to learn everything just in the I like the new strategies that the in class activities helps you be involved in the class instead of just sitting there, zoned out. Along with talking to my friend, I would constantly talk to the TAs. <laughs> By this point of the year, all the TAs actually pretty much know who I am, or at least some of them, because I always ask questions and whatnot. And I think utilizing that resource in class. Sigma bond, that's the head on. That's the one that attaches them directly to each other. Sometimes the students, we just kind of want to learn what happens. You know, point A, point B, what are your effort tests, and what do you want me to know, therefore I can do all your tests. Um, thinking like a chemist is kind of, you know, understanding the reason why. You know, why does this happen in the real world? Or why does this happen, you know, when you did a demo in class? I think that the thinking like a chemist idea definitely relates back to the conceptual ideas of everything we're learning, um, just really getting a real life understanding of everything and being able to apply it to the science side of things. All right, so with that, um, I, I just want to emphasize a couple of things. One, I really, one of the goals in the class is to get you to think and to try to approach problems in a particular way and understand the world around you from this molecular perspective that we develop as chemists. The best way to do that is to practice doing that. And therefore, we're gonna work on practicing doing that in class. And we'll do it in a number of different ways. There will be times where I will ask you to do things that you have not done before, and it will put you in an awkward, uncomfortable situation of thinking, I don't know how to do that, and that is a wonderful realization to realize, boy, I'm gonna have to think about this and try to sort this out in my head. Because while our students here say things like, oh, all of the learning I did was outside of class, I'll secretly tell you that's how all learning works for all classes. It's from the practice practice that you get and we want to set up the time in class to model how you should be approaching problems all the time. And so now is our chance with our learning assistants who are here to prod and help you answer questions, as well as to give you activities that guide you through how to think about a problem. And so today, we want to think like chemists about a couple of liquids. So we should have an activity. Hopefully, you have a course pack. And there, you hopefully have the activity on page 11. If somehow, somehow you don't, because you know, you just didn't know there was going to be such a thing. Um, we have one here, and in theory, we have copies that we're going to go get, so that um, those of you who don't have one, hopefully you can share with your neighbor. Um, we're going to think about two things, two things that seem very, very, very similar to one another. I have them here. They don't look like much. I have a bottle. Actually, I have all kinds of bottles of things that are the same. I have a bottle of acetone. And I have a bottle of isopropanol. They're two clear liquids. They have very similar chemical structures, but some of their properties are very different. And so the first part of our activity is going to bring back that idea from 301 that structure determines properties. 
That's why we care about structure and bonding. Very important to think about intermolecular forces and to think about properties, not just for, for small molecules, but in terms of interacting for all kinds of big molecules. And so we want to start out, we'll see uh, Cotton's getting some folks with a lot of extra copies. So once we get going, if you need a copy and you can't see the one up here, um, uh, raise your hand and we'll make sure you get one. Want to think about these two things, rubbing alcohol, isopropanol and acetone, also known as fingernail polish remover. Um, you can see the chemical structures there below. You want to draw a Lewis dot structure for them. Then, even though you won't get quizzed on this about naming geometries and so forth, you really want to picture in your head the structure and the 3D shape. Um, so think about the shape and the geometry and then try to get to what kind of intermolecular forces there are, all moving towards, we're going to focus on one property for this particular comparison with liquids, which is boiling points. And so first we're going to think about structures and then we're going to think about thermodynamics. And along the way, I'm going to ask you all some questions um, in terms of what the structures are. And Sophie here has the upgraded 302 only platinum stars. It's true more valuable than gold. And if you don't like platinum, we'll just say it's, I don't know, like rhenium or something like astronomically expensive. And so we have the upgraded stars for participation and we have um, after class, should you end up with a star or we don't have any candy today, um, we'll have, oh we do, look at that, so prepared. Um, we will have one of the graduate TAs up collecting your name after class. So with that, make sure we turn along, start working on what is the structure and what are the intermolecular forces, um, and we'll check in very shortly. If you get ahead, don't stop, just plow ahead. Um, that's the beauty of the worksheet, is you know what the questions are that are coming up. Yeah, raise your hand if you need a copy so that the allies are running around. Um, ooh, lots of people. There we go. you're sitting awkwardly quietly working on this you might want to consult with your neighbor who might be able to help you move along very very much faster um, so that you have some chance to have a gut check about what you're thinking and whether uh, it makes any sense or not.
structure because they don't spend ever time on the low side structure. All the carbons are bonded together. Carbon, carbon, carbon. When in doubt, make the carbon chain. <laughs> Okay, it's been a month. 
Oh, 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 you need to do it. Yeah. Not just that. And then we should do chemistry. Yeah. Yeah, I'll play that this match, right? Yeah. Okay, let's get together. With Isaac. I have a question. What's up? See this seat? Is that dipole? Uh, yeah, it's a dipole moment. It's taller. So it's a dipole. The dipole dipole. I think you can run it now. <laughs> there are a lot of fun. No, we just get angry because you have to keep refreshing the page. Yeah, you have to let me So it's not like this. So I guess the reason it wouldn't be dipole induced dipole is because if you're going to induce a dipole, then the molecule can't already be polar. And then it sounds like everything has to be mixing. Yeah, everything has to be And one of the first and foremost is another name for induced dipole. What research thing do you mean? Ah, how is it? Really? Are you excited? How many hours are we up there? I'm not quite sure, but like, how the actual just like cross section of it's only like two hours. Okay, um, so we can keep moving along. And again, I know there's lots of stuff coming up from last semester or not, um, but it's useful to um, think about these things. Um, I want to just quickly run through, in terms of molecular geometry, say, um, thinking about what the molecular geometry is, if we imagine this isopropanol. Let me tell me what the geometry is around this carbon that's right in the middle. Brain, soul, yes, what do you think it is? Trigonal planar. Ooh, are we sure? Does everybody agree? Disagree? Disagree. I gave a bad reaction, so you disagree? Yeah, what do you think it is? Tetrahedral. It's got it's it's my structure is not very good here because I had to sneak in this last little hydrogen here. It's got one two, three, four things around it. So four things around it is going to be tetrahedral around that carbon. What about this one here? What do you think it is? Yeah. Trigonal planar. There you go. That was trigonal planar. This has got one, two, three things around it. And so uh, when I think about sort of the shapes of these, but nonetheless, these molecules are kind of big, awkward, kind of funny little molecules. Um, if we think about the intermolecular forces, what kind of intermolecular forces are there for, say, the acetone? Now, to describe the intermolecular forces in acetone, you would say they are? Dispersion. Yeah. Uh, there's London dispersion forces and dipole, dipole. There you go. So there's dispersion forces, also known as oh, the London forces. And there are dipole, dipole forces because the molecule is polar. Why do you think it's polar? Because it has the oxygen attached to the carbon. There you go. There's this oxygen up here, more electronegative than the carbon, and a Thank partial you. negative charge there, partial positive charge here. Looks like it'll have a dipole going down it. So if the charges aren't all evenly distributed everywhere, it's going to end up being polar, which is typically the case. What about our, what are the forces in the propanol? Yeah. Dispersion, dipole, dipole, hydrogen. There you go. Dispersion. Why? Everything has dispersion forces. Dipole, dipole is polar, same thing. It's got that oxygen up there. It's going to create a little hot negative charge. And then last but not least, you said it has hydrogen bonding. Why does it have hydrogen bonding? Because it's an OH. Because it has an OH group. If you've got an OH group, you've got hydrogen bonding. That will get you very far in life. You need a hydrogen, which is bonded to an oxygen or a nitrogen or fluorine, but that's just HF. So it's really things to remember, a nitrogen with hydrogen on it, oxygen with hydrogen on it. That's going to create a very strong force between that molecule and another molecule. A hydrogen on that one OH group will look for an oxygen 
on another OH group on a different molecule. Okay, um, with that, um, let's think about a quick demo here between these two while we think about which has a higher boiling point. So I'm gonna have two quick volunteers, very fast. One, two. Great, right. how about two right here? He's right here, sorry. Yeah, come on, come on, let's go. So um, we have our two very exciting liquids. Acetone, isopropyl alcohol, both of which um, I would give you all kinds of safety equipment to, to use, but since they're squirt bottles full of things we can buy at the drugstore, um, I'm not going to do it at the moment. So this one is the isopropyl. This one is the acetone. Okay, I want you to put, as best you can, just like one little drop right in the, in the middle. It's going to come out a lot. There we go. Okay, that's good. And now, let's see if you can get one little drop in there. Oh, that's good. Oh, that's all right. We're good. Okay, so now, can anybody see the liquids at all? No, no, it's worst demo ever. Okay. Can you guys see it? Because you're going to have to report to everybody. Is there liquid in here? Yes. Okay. And if you had to guess, which one does it look like is evaporating faster? The one on the left. The one on the left seems to be. Um, the. Is it there anymore? No. Yeah, it's gone. Oh my goodness, it's gone. It's like you didn't put a drop in. Did you actually do it? Yeah, you did? Yes. You promise? You put a drop of liquid in there? I promise. Okay, excellent. So one of them is gone, and the other one? Uh, it's still there. Still there. Still there. It's amazing. One of them is just evaporated, and the other one is still there. And so which one evaporated? Uh, the acetone. The acetone. And so now for the $65,000 question, which one do you think have the stronger intermolecular forces? The isopropanol. The isopropanol, yeah. Molecules stick together more and they're not evaporating, okay? So stronger intermolecular forces is going to mean higher boiling point and lower evaporation rate. Harder to pull the molecules apart from each other. So now I want to look at that from sort of a thermodynamic standpoint. So many thanks to our lovely volunteers. And let's plow ahead. We have to think back now. Now it's really, really churning back into your knowledge. We're going to bring back thermodynamics. Oh, I love thermodynamics. Thermodynamics, everyone should love thermodynamics. And I'll tell you the beauty of thermodynamics, and this is the beauty of this semester. We get to move from the calculate the work and calculate the heat thermodynamics into the really cool, is it positive or is it negative, and how does that tell me what happens in the world thermodynamics? And so now it's much more on just the is it positive or is it negative, is it endothermic, is it exothermic, understanding of the way the world works and not into the can you do the integral of the heat capacity divided by the temperature, something, 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 figure out the entropy for temperature change. Instead, we're going to think about why would protein folding be spontaneous? Or why in the world would something evaporate or not evaporate? And we get to think about things from a conceptual standpoint. So first question is, um, which of these things do you think has a higher enthalpy? This is a general question. Liquids or gases, and here it's actually liquid water or gaseous water. So, see if I can actually get this question to add, go, whoops, I want to do this one. Okay, so liquid water, gaseous water, they're exactly the same, it depends on the temperature. Enthalpy, which one has a higher enthalpy? Try to answer for yourself, and then once you're convinced you know what the answer is, um, see if you can share your answer with your neighbor and, and you guys either have the same answer or you're in complete disagreement.
We will start class every day with a few sort of quiz questions, and even those, I think, are 60% is participation. Um, but anything we ask kind of along the way is all just, I want to know what you're, what you're thinking. Um, so I'll say that. Everyone will now change their answer to what they think is the right answer is. But uh, nonetheless, we'll go along. So gaseous water here um, is what we mostly think. Is there someone who can tell me why they think the gas is higher in enthalpy? Yes. Okay, so you're saying that at, to be a gas, I have to be at a higher temperature. And that's absolutely true. That if I get the temperature really, really high, most things end up as a gas. But what if, what if I'm at the, the boiling point? I'm right at the boiling point. I got liquid and I got gas. Same temperature. Hmm. Are they the same then? Does it depend on the temperature? If you think about the enthalpy, what are you thinking about for the substance? It's a very large, random question to ask. Yeah? There are more microstates. More microstates. You're thinking entropy. I'm thinking enthalpy. We'll get to entropy in just a second. I like thinking about entropy. Yeah, but enthalpy. The heat. OK, so everybody is probably thinking about the heat. And we just beat it into you over and over and over again. Enthalpy is heat. Enthalpy is heat. Enthalpy is heat. That's how we measure the change in enthalpy, is it's related to heat. But when you think about the enthalpy of something, you should think about its energy, and it's, in particular, its potential energy. Okay, so I want you guys to wrap your heads around that. Enthalpy, we're thinking about potential energy. And gases have a higher potential energy than liquids. Why is that? Intermolecular forces. So it's definitely true gases is the answer, but we don't know why. Gases have a higher potential energy. Why? The molecules aren't next to each other. They used to be right next to each other. What does it mean to be attracted to something in a like a molecular sense? Um, it means that when you're next to the molecule, you have a lower energy. So if you have to pull the molecule apart, you have to put energy in to overcome those forces. And so we go from a low energy state, everybody's next to each other, to a high energy state where everybody's far apart. And so the enthalpy is higher in the gas. And in fact, if I want to do that, if I want to go from the liquid to the gas, I'm going to have to put energy in. So even if I'm at the boiling point, the water is 100 degrees, it's on the stove, it's boiling. If you want it to actually convert from liquid to vapor, you have to keep putting energy in because the gas is a higher energy state. OK, so thinking about that, we want to think about the sign of vaporization. So now, delta H vaporization, I want to think about what that is. This is defined. Remember what vaporization is. How are we going to find final states and initial states? And how are we going to think about the sign of vaporization. So this one uh, you should be able to do very quickly because otherwise we're not going to get to what 
I want to think about today. Although this is well along the way. Delta H vaporization. What do you think? Ooh, that ooh, that didn't quite show up. There it goes. Positive, negative, zero. Quickly, quickly, yeah, right there. It requires a higher amount of energy to vaporize. Why does it require more energy to vaporize? Because of the ionic forces. Because it has stronger intermolecular forces. It has hydrogen bonding where acetone does not. Okay? More intermolecular forces, that's going to be bigger delta H. So here's the thing I want you to keep in mind for now for the rest of the semester, because it's a very important concept. Intermolecular forces. Enthalpy. 
intermolecular forces, enthalpy. That's what we're going to think about all the time. We're going to think about it for molecules. We're going to think about it for uh, substance dissolving in water. How do we think about delta H? Intermolecular forces. Okay, so since intermolecular forces are going to be our enthalpy chunk, now we want to think about entropy. And so very quickly, um, we have another question, which is which do you think would have a higher entropy? Let me just skip my little review here. Higher entropy, liquids or gases? And again, the example is water, because that's the substance that we all know. But it's true in general. That is, liquid something dashes something, or they're exactly the same, or it depends on the temperature. things to remember about entropy. But which is higher? Liquid? Gas? They're the same depends on the temperature. Most of us think it's the gas. Excellent. I like that idea. Um, can somebody tell me why they think it's the gas? Yes, right here in the center. Let's be quiet so we can hear what the answer is. Higher number of microstates for the gas. Yeah. In a liquid, what are the molecules? They're all right next to each other. You can rearrange them, but there's not very many choices. The gas, the gas has all of this space to explore. If you think about the same amount of molecules in a liquid, very small little area or spread out everywhere. A little drop, little tiny drop of isopropanol was on the plate. Now, isopropanol is all over the room. It evaporated eventually. Same thing with our acetone. So more microstates. So thinking about qualitatively in terms of entropy, um, how does it vary? Just try to remember. Make the volume larger, you get more entropy. Make the temperature higher, you get more entropy. Changing phases, um, I jumped ahead. Solids low, everybody's beautifully arranged. Liquids a little bit higher, not much, but a little bit higher. And then gases, whoo, much higher. All of a sudden you go from everybody being in their own little place to spread out all over the universe. And the other one is with reactions. More molecules, higher entropy. So if I go from a, lots of bonding and not very many molecules, a big explosion, lots of molecules, that reaction is likely increasing the entropy. And most importantly, we're going to tie this up in terms of the free energy. That's the thing we're always going to think about. But remember, it is the entropy of the universe that's always increasing. Second law of thermodynamics, the entropy of the universe always increases. Why? It's just the most likely thing to happen. Entropy is not some mystical force. More microstates just means better chance if something random happened that that's what's going to happen. And so everything in the universe is moving towards this most probable configuration. Um, so with that, let's think about um, entropy um, for these two molecules. And in particular, delta S of vaporization. So first, you probably want to think about delta S vaporization in general. What's the sign? Is the entropy going up? Is it going down? And then for these two, which do you think is higher? Is the entropy change going to be large for isopropanol compared to acetone, or about the same, or will it vary depending on the temperature? So this is a hard one. All of a sudden, something new to think about. What about the entropy of vaporization? Enthalpy, we chalked it all up to IMF. What about the entropy? Yeah. 
thing. The first thing to think about is the sign, positive, negative, zero, and then decide which one is bigger. They were all, oh no, there it is. Everybody was all about the same. The question is how in the world to think about this one? The intermolecular forces are the enthalpy. I said that like four times. I'm going to say it again. Intermolecular forces, enthalpy. That's how we're going to think about it. So how in the world to think about the entropy? And to think about the entropy, we have to think about what's <coughs> actually changing. In the liquid, the molecules are next to each other. In the gas phase, molecules are far apart. So I have to think about how many ways can I arrange the molecules in the liquid compared to how many ways can I arrange the molecule in the gas phase. And there are certainly more microstates in the gas phase compared to the liquid. It's a big change. And the question is, what's the change like for each of these liquids? So gases always have a higher entropy in liquids. Um, it's because of this big phase change. Molecules all next to each other to the molecules spread out and far apart. Um, almost every substance on the planet, the difference in entropy between the liquid and the gas is the same. It's the same because the molecules don't change. The molecules just change position. They used to be next to each other, and now they're far apart. And that's the big difference. And so as it turns out, delta H or delta S of vaporization is the same for almost every liquid. It's this random number, 85. 85 joules per Kelvin per mole, just by chance. That's what it works out to. And it's because the molecules aren't changing. The molecules are changing position, but the molecules themselves don't change. So if this molecule has more entropy than this molecule, Maybe there's a difference between them, but when I take them both up into the gas phase, the difference between those two is the same. So the change upon vaporization is nearly identical. There is one exception, one big exception. Big exception is water. If you don't learn anything in the world about liquids, you should know water is weird. 
Water is always the exception. And water is the exception because it has unbelievably strong hydrogen bonds. And it has nothing to do with the fact that they're held together more tightly. Does anybody know why it might be weird for water? It's not that they're stuck so tightly together. Anybody know anything about water, liquid water, that might make the entropy strange? Yeah. Oh, it definitely expands when it freezes. It's totally bizarre, which is the same reason that it's different with the entropy. Yeah. It's more dense with the liquid. It's more dense with its liquid. It's the same problem, same thing. Is that it has a structure. Most liquids, willy-nilly, the molecules are just oriented whichever way, and they kind of try to arrange their dipoles and this, that, and the other. Thing. Water is hydrogen bonded in this big network. You can just keep drawing H's to O's to H's to O's to H's to O's to H's to O's. And it is that hydrogen bond network that means there are fewer microstates than you would think for water when it's a liquid. Every molecule just isn't any old place. They're in particular places all stuck together. And it's that structure of water that gives it these weird density properties. And it's the structure of water that means delta S is really big for water. Delta S of vaporization is really big for water. Everything else, it goes from kind of random liquid to random gas. Water goes from structured liquid to random gas. And so it's a bigger change. So technically, I went and looked them up. Isopropanol is a little bit bigger for delta S. It's a little teeny tiny bit bigger for delta S because it has the hydrogen bond. So it's not quite as random liquid. But on par, almost every liquid is the same. OK, with that, we can now take what we know about delta H, take know what we know about delta S, and think about delta G, the free energy that tells us what happens in the world. So which do you think has a lower free energy? Liquid water, gaseous water, they're exactly the same, or it depends on the temperature. Look at what our answers are here. See where we are. What did we do? Let's see. Hello. Did something press the button. Okay. It's either liquid or it's the gas, or it depends on the temperature. 
We did not go for it's exactly the same. Um, as we're desperately all changing to it depends on the temperature. Does somebody want to tell me why they think it's, it depends on the temperature? Yes. Okay, so he says if delta S is the same, then it's going to depend on the temperature to tell us about delta G. And that's true to some extent, but remember, delta S is the same for different substances. Here we're comparing the same substance. It's water and it's water. And I just want to know liquid water compared to gaseous water, which one has got the lower free energy? It does depend on the temperature, though, because as he pointed out, delta G, delta H, minus T, delta S, there's a temperature in the formula. Do we have another answer? Depends on the temperature. Can anybody tell me which is more stable, high free energy or low free energy? Low, okay? The whole world, the entire universe, goes from high free energy to low free energy. I was sitting in a seminar one time sitting over there, fancy speaker, coming from out of town, talking about what they were doing. Somebody asked them a question about why this happened. They said, well, it's because the things are moving towards their lowest free energy. And it's like, that's why everything happens. That's not an explanation, right? If anybody asks you why something's happening, you just say, oh, it's going to low free energy. Um, so low free energy, that is the, the stable place. So now the question is, which is more stable, liquid water or gaseous water? It depends. Why does it depend? Yeah. It depends on the temperature. Crank the temperature up to 400 degrees Kelvin. I can tell you, liquid water, not particularly stable. It will all be gaseous. And in fact, if we wanted to go to negative 85 degrees, liquid water, not particularly stable, it's going to be solid. The lowest free energy state is the most stable, and it changes with temperature, which is why there are phase transitions. And so what we're going to look for is the place where we're switching over. Delta G is minus is delta H minus T delta S. We're balancing these two. There's the energy, there's the entropy. And we're trying to figure out which one is more important. That's why we invented the free energy. And so here we know delta H of vaporization greater than zero, delta S of vaporization greater than zero. So we have these two things which are counteracting each other in the phase transition. Delta H is positive. That's not the spontaneous direction. Things do not go uphill in energy. So the positive delta H is not helping delta G be negative. Delta S is positive. That's what we want. Everything in the world wants to be positive, positive increase in entropy. And so we've got these two things. This one is going up. That's going to give us a little frowny face. This one is going up. That's going to give us a little smiley face. That is, one of them is making the free energy go up. One of them is making the free energy go down. We have to say which one's going to win. It depends on the temperature. The temperature is zero. Everything is delta H. Temperature is infinity. Everything is delta S. In between, it depends on where we settle. So we're going to try to find a very important point. We're trying to find an important point where there's no change. Neither is more stable. Delta G is equal to zero. That's the point that we're interested in. We're going to spend a whole crazy semester talking about where delta G is equal to zero. That's the equilibrium point. And it's not that it's so super important. It's just that that's the place where things stop changing. Because when delta G is equal to zero, neither the products nor the reactants, neither the final state nor the initial state is more stable. Everything is the same. And when that's true, since delta H is equal to, or delta G is delta H minus T delta S, if that's equal to zero, I rearrange that, and what do I find? Delta H is equal to T delta S. So when delta G is equal to zero, I have this magic point. If I know delta H and I know delta S, I know the temperature at which that is true. So what are we going to think about for a phase change? Phase change is that point, this dynamic equilibrium point, where it's not that things have stopped, 
If you're at a phase transition temperature, you've got boiling water, 100 degrees C, liquid water, water vapor. It's not that there's no change, it's that you have the same number of molecules going in each direction. As many molecules boiling as there are condensing. And we're going to do a reaction. As many molecules turning into reactants, as there are molecules turning into products. And so the net change comes out to be zero. And that's the point we're going to be interested in. If I want to know where the temperature is, what do I need to do? I'll say, assume delta G is equal to zero. And that lets me think about T is delta H divided by delta S. That is, if I know delta H and I know delta S, I can figure out the temperature. So we're going to use that a lot when we think about phase transitions, which is how we're going to start the semester. So I want you guys to now think about this problem. Comparing acetone and isopropanol. This is question 18. Um, which one has the higher temperature when delta G of vaporization is equal to zero? Okay, so delta G of vaporization says at some point, the free energy of the liquid and the free energy of the gas are the same. Okay? At some temperature, the liquid is more stable. At some temperature, the gas is more stable. But there is a temperature at which they're exactly the same. And which one has a higher temperature for that? Is it the isopropanol? Is it the acetone? Is there no way to answer the question without some data? Are they identical? Or does it vary depending on whether it's a leader or just a drop of liquid? Okay, let's think about this one a sec. Try to get an answer in. It's not A. You can say something without the data. If you had the data, it would be trivial. If I gave you delta H and delta S for both of these compounds, there'd be no problem to be able to answer without any problem. But without the data, qualitatively, can we figure it out? What do we think? Oh, look at you guys. You're just so, so good. We're putting it all together. Nice and broken all. So now the question is, did we get the right answer for the right reason? Or was it just random? So can somebody tell me, why did you think it was isopropanol? Uh, because we get the temperature, like, the isopropanol has a higher energy, so it should be divided by it. And what about delta S? There you go. So if I think about the two, I'm going to think about the temperature for acetone is delta H for the acetone divided by delta S for the acetone. This is the vaporization. And if I think about isopropanol, it's the enthalpy of vaporization for the isopropanol divided by the entropy. And as was pointed out, delta H for isopropanol is larger. Delta S is the same. So larger delta H means a higher boiling point. This is the reason 
we can chalk up all kinds of stuff to intermolecular forces. Okay? If it wasn't true, it would be a disaster. We'd say things like stronger intermolecular forces, that should be less evaporation. Well, it depends on the entropy. But as it turns out, it doesn't depend on the entropy because the entropy is the same. The entropy change is the same for all these substances. And so we can throw everything in terms of the vaporization behavior into delta H. Okay? It's not as easy when we get to melting. Melting, delta S of melting is not the same for every substance on the planet. And so unfortunately for melting, intermolecular forces is not everything. Oh, dude, that's awesome. And so it makes it very hard to predict melting points. Melting points are really hard to predict. Boiling points, really easy to predict. It's all intermolecular forces. Melting points, it depends, because it depends on delta H and it depends on delta S. Okay? Um, we want to think about now well, how are we going to use this moving forward? We're going to think about phase transitions. Solids to liquids, liquids to gases, solids to gases. We're going to think about what temperatures uh, do those things happen? How do we get a phase diagram to figure out when, when a substance is stable and when it's not? We're going to think about making solutions and dissolving things. Why is it that something is in a solid and then you chuck it into liquid water and it decides to just dissolve everywhere? Okay. Always, 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 delta H is going to be our intermolecular forces. The entropy is going to be the part that we're going to have to wrap our heads around. Just to make sure you know, every day when we come up here on the Canvas site, if you go to class notes here, there'll be a little table. There'll be a key for what we did today here. There'll be a copy of the slides, which are the annotated slides, and a copy of student notes, which brings in the last thing before we leave. And we need a volunteer, a volunteer who actually writes things neatly, um, for whom we can snap some photos of your notes every day to put them up on the website to make sure that we have a good copy of student notes. I have an idea. And if you're a star or a candy wrapper and want to make sure you get put down for the bonus points, um, you want to come up and find you know, the awesome. sleeper yeah. time to do it. Honestly, it's like you're going to get up on the site.
do you think that this has to do with mass subscription? Uh, well, it's the same as mass subscription. You have to like buy and shit. You shouldn't. No? Because I had it with you last right. semester. No, that's why I was wondering why it wasn't. Maybe it, did you add late or something? I mean, I'll, I hadn't checked this. Like, no, no, I'm saying did you add this class late? Like, no, we like, sent them to you. Uh, so I've been involved since, since the beginning. Yeah. Send an email to the class email. We'll contact the top back class. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Done? Yeah.